annual International Symposium on Human Identity. I'm Bill Linton, CEO at Promega, and it's really great to be here with all of you. And uh, for many of us, after so many years in person, uh, it's really great to have this collection together. And last night, what a unique opportunity we had to be at the reception uh, celebrating Halloween and how many of you showed up in so many creative and artful ways. We're going to see just what you looked like last night. Okay. Woo. Sort of uh, creative, a bit outrageous, uh, but a lot of fun. So uh, thanks for showing up last night like you did. So ISHI is the largest global DNA forensics meeting, drawing more than 1,100 attendees and from 42 different countries. Uh, this year, our symposium is filled with information that we hope is going to enrich the work that you do from new technologies, policies, and approaches to deep dives into some really fascinating cases. Our 33rd meeting will address a host of leading topics and sometimes challenging subject matter. And it goes without saying that DNA analysts are no strangers to complexity. The topics that we discuss here, like the issues and cases you encounter every day in the field of the lab, they're hardly simple. But our goal here has always been to bring many voices and different viewpoints to the table. We hope that this facilitates nuanced and curious discussions and holds space for asking and discussing those really complicated questions. Uh, not always agreeing on the answers or even on whether an answer exists. But thanks for your willingness to engage in these thoughtful discussions, your openness advances not only the science and the technology of forensics DNA, but also the attitudes and approaches of doing this work. We're progressing and growing the field by collecting together here and by exchanging really important information. And through this, I'm certain that we're gonna benefit many, many lives for generations to come. I also wanna express my sincere appreciation to everybody who submitted the abstracts, our reviewers, presenters, panelists, and our vendors. Don't forget at the breaks, downstairs, have some refreshments, but also visit our vendors and uh, see what they have to offer as well. It's an honor to engage in this invigorating and thought-provoking work year after year. Um, I'd also like the time to recognize the effort and commitment of the people at Promega who plan and organize this meeting every year. They really do an amazing job. Uh, and as you see them in the coming days, uh, please share with them your ideas. And what we need are your feedback. We have to have your suggestions on how we can continue to improve this meeting each year. And finally, thanks to everybody for making ISHI your priority this week. We know schedules, travel, everything's busy, uh, but you've made that commitment to be here, so thank you very much. And now I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning will explore a grim time in the United States history and efforts to locate and identify the victims of these very tragic events. So the red summer of 1919 was an outbreak of racist massacres and lynchings that affected more than 25 cities across America. This set the stage for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre in which a white mob descended on a predominantly black neighborhood in Oklahoma. Historians call it the single worst incident of racist violence committed against black Americans in the United States. Black men, women, and children were brutally murdered. Homes and buildings were burned and bombed. The town of Greenwood, Oklahoma, also known at the time as the Black Wall Street, was decimated. 
Despite the staggering violence and devastation, you would have been hard pressed to find any mention of this race massacre in history books over the last century. In fact, most in Tulsa never spoke of it, and if they did, it was in soft, quiet voices. Survivors kept secrets just to remain alive and to hopefully assure the violence wouldn't happen again, leaving evidence hidden and crucial stories untold for decades. Today, many are undertaking the challenging and painful work of uncovering these stories through a number of diverse methods. You're here for some of these people here this morning, starting with our keynote speaker, Deneen Brown. Deneen was born in Oklahoma and has been a reporter at the Washington Post for more than 35 years. She's reported extensively on the Tulsa Race Massacre, including a 2018 front page story that prompted the mayor of Tulsa to reopen an investigation into the search for mass graves of black people killed during the massacre. We thank you, Janine, for starting our discussion this morning, and we'll begin with a video. Thank you. They got word that trouble was coming. The white folks are killing the color. Barbaric violence was committed against black people across this country. Kerosene was dropped from an airplane. Why did nobody ever teach us this? Because they didn't want you to know. When it was an opportunity to wipe out a community, they took it. I cannot imagine that there are mass graves somewhere in our community and we didn't try to find them. They're buried somewhere. And the question is where? We have encountered human remains. It was like they had found people who had been disappeared by history. The earth had unleashed the truth. We view this as a murder investigation. I'm gonna raise my voice. I'm gonna Some people say that city voice. officials orchestrated a cover-up. It wasn't a movie. It wasn't a chapter in a book. It happened to real people. They burned the whole town down. But it will rise again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. I thank you to the organizers of the symposium, the 2022 International Symposium on Human Identification. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Carol. Thank you to Kevin Ross, a true descendant of that massacre who is here, with whom you'll speak later. I want to thank you to the audience for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you and I see you. I thank you for your excellence. I want, just want to take a minute to acknowledge that we're standing here on land of the Piscataway Tribal Nation. I want to affirm the need to share that history of the rightful past, present, and future inhabitants of this land. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are here on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who are the ancestral stewards of this land. It is the historical responsibility of First Nations to advocate for the four-legged, the winged, those that crawl, and those that swim. They remind us that clean air and pristine waterways are essential to all life, so we acknowledge them. Ashe, and so it is. I stand here humble with a thousand ancestors at my back. I stand here a descendant of enslaved African people, those who were kidnapped from the continent of Africa, forced on slave ships that transcended the mighty Atlantic Ocean, 
forced into captivity and into a brutal and system of enslavement, a system so barbaric and inhumane. It was a system that was so cruel that it tried to beat out of my ancestors their culture, language, and songs. And yet, we stand here. We know that it was the mission of colonizers to exterminate all indigenous and African people, and yet we stand here, a testament to the strength of people who are resilient, strong, spiritual, a people who could make a way out of no way. I stand here as a journalist, independent, as a writer, not a scientist, not a lawyer, can't do any of what you do. All I can do is report and write, and that's what I do. I'm inspired by the stories of ancestors and those who were killed in racist terror, violence in this country. For, for too long, their voices have been silenced. So we're here to, to listen and to tell their stories. Have you ever wondered why they kept these stories of racist terror lynchings and massacres a secret? Why were these events literally whitewashed out of history books and out of textbooks? For the next few minutes, I want to share with you some of those stories they did not want you to know. As we listen to the stories of survivors and those who witnessed atrocities, Let's think about what we can do, what we all can do, to help uncover those lost and racist terror lynchings and massacres in this country. As filmmaker Raul Peck said in his series, Exterminate All the Brutes, you, are, you already know enough. What is missing is the courage to understand and to take action. Very much like Peck, it has been my mission and my reporting to tell the stories, to address the historical racism that lurks in corners of society. It is important to blast and deconstruct the false histories. It's important to establish the stories of racist terror. So in some African cultures, if the dead are not buried properly, it is said that the spirit of the person may wander the earth. The soul floats. Proper burials are essential to many people in African cultures. I was just lucky enough to be in the Gullah Geechee Corridor in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And the elders there told me that the Gullah Geechee, who are direct descendants of African peoples, it's their practice to bury their ancestors facing east so that the soul returns to Africa. I just want to think, um, want us to think this morning about how important it is that the, those people who were lost in racist terror lynchings and massacres be buried properly. As Ida B. Wells, the great investigative journalist, once said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Let's together turn the light of truth on this history. So um, the title for this keynote is Pursue the Truth, Dig for the Truth, Uncover the Truth, and Stand in the Truth. As a journalist, it's been my duty to re be relentless relentless in my quest for truth. I learned this as a young reporter in the Washington Post newsroom. I was a summer intern who was hired by Ben Bradley, the editor of, of Watergate fame. At the end of that summer internship, I walked into Bradley's office where he offered me a job. 
actually I said, I'm so happy I think I'll cry, but uh, I was thrilled that I would work and learn with the best in the business. I spent the next 35 years as an editor and, and reporter at the Washington Post newsroom, and each day I would walk by a sign in the lobby of the Washington Post, and it would remind us journalists what our mission was. That sign said, we should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So this morning, I'd like us together to think about that mission. I believe it can be expanded to other professions. What can we do, what can you do in your profession to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted? Perhaps by going about the work of uncovering the truth of racist terror in this country, scientists too can afflict the comfortable. Again, for too long, these stories, no, not just stories, but events involving real people, real men, women, and children, black and indigenous people in this country and indeed around the world have been killed in mass and racist terror violence. This is what I, um, if there's an enduring lesson from today, I've been a professor, I'd like you guys to remember this, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I want to hear, um, let's hear from some of the witnesses directly what happened. It may make us uncomfortable, but we must know what they endured in order to know what we must do next. Some people ask me, doesn't this reporting impact you? No, I often say, because nothing I endure in my reporting can be as bad as what my ancestors endured in racist terror, violence, and terror. The ancestors want us to tell their stories. So Bill said in, my, in the introduction that I was born in Oklahoma. People often ask me how I got started reporting on the Tulsa race massacre. And is it true? I was born in Oklahoma. My father is a descendant of Creek Freedmen. My paternal grandmother was born in Boley, Oklahoma, which is a small, all-black town not far from Tulsa. Many of you may know that during the massacre, many black people fled from Greenwood to surrounding all-black towns. My paternal great-grandmother lived in Tulsa, although I did not know her. I don't remember when and where I first heard about the massacre, but when I lived in Tulsa as a teenager, the place was heavy and it struck me as haunted, as though the very ground had a story to tell. It was in 2018 that I started thinking more deeply about racist terror in this country. My reporting on the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama set the stage for my reporting on Tulsa. I just want to take a minute to let you guys experience what that was like. Can we? I guess we can't. Um, can we click on that and run that? No. Can we run the video? So this is, this is the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. I wanted you guys to be able to experience it, but you can click on that link later. So in 2018, the Washington Post sent me to Montgomery, Alabama to cover the opening of the memorial to the lynching museum. There I interviewed Brian Stevenson. You may know him, he's a Mac MacArthur genius who's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. Stevenson worked to build the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, here it is, 
It's often called the lynching memorial, and it's the country's first memorial dedicated to the legacy of enslaved black people terrorized by racist terror lynchings. Stevenson told me in my interview about the importance of having public memorials to remind us of what happened and to help with the healing. His was an effort to, quote, reshape the cultural landscape with monuments and memorials that more truthfully and accurately reflect the country's history. It was in Montgomery, Alabama that I personally came face to face in a physical way with the horror of this racist terror in the past. Let me paint a picture for you. The memorial stands on a grassy mound. The memorial sits on six acres of land and is designed with art and sculptures that reflect the history of racist terror. Visitors walk up a winding path to the entrance, and there each visitor is confronted with these six-foot vertical tombs, which look very much like coffins. Upon the tombs, names of thousands of black men, women, and children who were lynched in this country are carved into those tombs that are made of metal. I walked amid the columns, between them, around them, amid them until they rose above my head, and underneath each one of them is the county in which these lynchings occurred. I frantically took notes in my reporter's notebook, scribbling down the stories of why. Why were these people lynched? Some of the stories, for example, included the story of a woman who was lynched for scolding white children for throwing rocks at her. Another family, black family, was lynched for, for drinking from a white family's well. A black man was lynched for accidentally bumping into a white woman. The memorial was profound and eerie, and it moved me. After filing the story for the Washington Post on the lynching memorial, this is important. I flew from Montgomery, Alabama to Washington and then to Lawrence, Kansas, and then hit the highway driving through the Flint Hills of Kansas to visit my family, and then hit the highway again, taking that Cimarron turnpike across Tornado Alley to Tulsa, where I was to visit my father. Now I'm a daddy's girl. I asked my father whether we could have lunch on Black Wall Street. And there we were having lunch at Wanda's Cafe, a soul food cafe on Greenwood Avenue. I looked around and I noticed that there was a minor league baseball stadium. There was a yoga studio and a new apartment complex right on the site of the massacre. I knew that this was the site of the Tulsa Race Massacre, the single worst incident of racial, racial terror violence committed against black people in U.S. history. And yet there was no memorial very much like the one that I saw in Montgomery, Alabama. So that was my mindset. I looked around and I thought to myself, oh my God, Black Wall Street, the site of this horrible massacre is being gentrified. From there, I flew back to Washington. I told my editor about my lunch with my father, and the editors at the Post sent me back to Tulsa to report to see what I could find. On the ground in Tulsa, I walked with the descendants of the massacre. They insisted that I walk the streets, the same streets survivors of that massacre walked when they were rounded up. There's a point in the reporting of a story when the reporter hits the very core, when the story becomes so real that it hits you right here. And that's when old editors say, that's when you can evoke 
the soul of the story. That's when you can write a story with as much power as you can to get listeners and readers to take action. That time came for me when I walked with my hands up down the streets of Tulsa, leading to the old convention center where dozens of black men marched in that day, hands up. Many of them never came out. Many of them disappeared. The story hit me here. My story about the mass graves was published on the front page of the Washington Post in September 2018. The story included information about the Tulsa Race Riot Commission report, which had been published in 2001. This is important because that state commission made several recommendations, including that rep reparations be paid to survivors and descendants of the massacre, that a scholarship fund be set up for students affected by the massacre, that a memorial be erected to victims of the massacre, and that officials physically search for mass graves of victims. But some of the recommendations in that report were not heeded. In 2001, Tulsa's mayor decided to close that investigation before scientists like Clyde Snow and others could physically search for mass graves. And for nearly 20 years, again, it seemed that the search for mass graves of those connected to the Tulsa race massacre was over. But this is where the work, I believe, of journalists comes in. Long after a story lies dormant, some journalists return to the scenes of the crime, and they begin asking questions. And they peel back the layers of an issue. And they report, and they report, and they report, and they write, and they write, and when the story is published, what follows is determined by readers. The power doesn't lie with the reporters, but it lies with you, readers. In this case, this is what happened. My story, again, was published in 2018 on the front page. The headline read, they was killing black people. That was a quote from Vanessa Hall Harper's grandmother who told her very quietly about the massacre in a whisper, they was killing black people. Two days after the story's publication, Tulsa's mayor held a meeting in North Tulsa about new development. A minister sitting in the back of the room stood up at the very end of the meeting. He held up a copy of the story and he said, you wouldn't have this land to develop had there not been a massacre. What are you going to do about it? And that's when the mayor of Tulsa announced that he would reopen an investigation into mass graves. I just want to pause for a moment. Bill did an excellent job of telling you about the massacre, and I'm sure many of you guys have read the story. You know the story. But it's important to tell the story time and time again, because stories live in the retelling of the story. The Tulsa Race Massacre began on May 30th, 1931. The trigger event that sparked the massacre began when Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old black teenager, a shoe shiner working in downtown Tulsa on that hot holiday weekend, decided he had to go to the restroom. He walked into the Drexel building, which had the only toilet available to black people in a segregated Tulsa. Roland stepped on the elevator operated by Sarah Page, a white elevator operator. When the wire-caged elevator doors opened again, Sarah unleashed a piercing scream. A department store clerk heard the scream, and Dick Roland took off running. The clerk called the police. Now, it's unclear what happened in that elevator, but in my, re my research, I found that the elevator was a wire-caged elevator. You could see right through it.
The Oklahoma Historical uh, Society reported that the most common explanation was that Roland stepped on, the, on Paige's foot, causing her to shriek. Now, some black people in Tulsa, some relatives of Dick Rowland said the two were in love. A cousin of Dick Rowland would later say that Dick and Sarah not only knew each other before he stepped on the elevator, but they were planning to get married and defy Oklahoma's ban on interracial marriage. Whatever caused her to scream on that elevator, it was a shriek that would set off the worst single racist terror attack against black people in US history. The next day, the Tulsa Tribune newspaper ran a headline that said, quote, let's see whether I can get to that. Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. The report was false, the report was sensational. Prosecutors would later drop all charges and Dick Rowland would be exonerated. But it was too late. The lie had been published. The flame of racial hatred had been lit. The fury of the white mob in Tulsa had been unleashed. Historians say that headline was a whistle call to the Klan that had amassed in Oklahoma during that Jim Crow period, which some historians call the Great Nadir, an especially dangerous time in this country for black people. Hours after the headline was printed, a mob of hundreds of white people marched to downtown Tulsa and swarmed outside the, the courthouse where Dick Rowland had been detained. At the same time, a group of black men living in Greenwood, that prosperous all-black community, many of them World War I veterans, they knew how to fight. They too marched to the courthouse. They wanted to pre prevent a lynching. Now, lynching was real at this time in, in the country. It was, very, it was a very real possibility. It was a tool of racial terror that was frequently used in the late 1800s and 1900s. It was a reality for any black child, black man, black boy, black woman, especially those accused of assaulting a white woman. In the crowd, a white man confronted one of those veterans. Now, these veterans had gone off to fight in the great World War I to defend democracy and had returned home expecting that they would be treated as equals. They knew how to fight. A white man confronted a black veteran in the crowd and said, what are you going to do with that gun, N-word? And the black veteran said, I'm going to use it if I have to. A struggle erupted. The gun went off, and historians say all hell broke loose. Hundreds of white people marched on Greenwood in a murderous rage. City officials deputized members of the white mob, if that is documented. The white mob set fire to hundreds of black-owned businesses and homes in a district that was once so prosperous, Booker, Booker T. Washington called it Negro Wall Street. They tried to kill all the black folks they could see. George Monroe, a survivor of the massacre, recalled later in the documentary, The Night Tulsa Burned. A massacre survivor, Olivia Hooker, later called the massacre the catastrophe. Olivia was only six when she witnessed the mob marching on Greenwood. Her mother hid her and her siblings under a dining room table as their home was being ransacked. We could see what they were doing. Dr. Hooker told me during an interview before she died at the age of 103. They took everything they thought was valuable. They smashed everything they couldn't take. Tulsa became the first US city, according to historians, 
bombed from the air. Don Ross, then the state representative in Tulsa, who led the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, wrote that black people tried to defend Greenwood, but then, he said, the airplanes came dropping bombs. All the black community was burned to the ground and 300 black people dead. Both black and white witnesses told of airplanes flying over Greenwood in the early hours of June 1st, 1921. B.C. Franklin, a lawyer who worked in Greenwood, downtown Greenwood, was an eyewitness. He wrote, I'm going to read it to you because it's beautiful. From my office window, I could see planes circling down East Archer Street. I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire burning from the top, and then another and another and another building began burning from the top. What? An attack from the air, too? I asked. Lurid flames roared and belched and licked their forked tongues into the air. Smoke ascended the sky in thick black volumes, and amid it all, the planes, now a dozen or more, still hummed and darted here and there with the agility of birds of the air. Franklin ran to escape, but the sidewalks were covered with turpentine balls. I knew too well where they came from, he wrote. I knew all too well why every burning building first caught from the top. I paused and I waited for an opportune time to escape. Where, oh where, is our splendid fire department with its half dozen stations? I asked myself, is the city in conspiracy with the mob? Each act committed by the white mob seemed to grow in brutality. The mob was ruthless, cold-blooded, and showing no mercy to babes or old people. Let's hear directly from some real people who witnessed these events. And remember, it is so important to hear these stories time and time again. These are the stories they did not want you to know. One massacre survivor recalled a mob killing a blind black man in a wheelchair. These are his words. I was downtown with my friend when they killed that good old colored man that was blind. His body was attached at the hips with a small wooden platform with wheels. He scooted his body around by shoving and pushing with his hands covered with baseball catcher mitts. He supported himself by selling pencils or accepting donations for songs. The white mob tied a rope around the neck of that man and dragged him through the streets of Greenwood. These are the stories they did not want you to know. Across town, black people resisted. Yeah, they put up a good fight, historians said. As the mob moved through Greenwood, Dr. A.C. Jackson shot back to defend his wife, his children, and his home. Jackson was one of the best doctors in the world. The Mayo brothers had descri described him as, quote, the most able Negro surgeon in America. The mob surrounded Dr. Jackson's mansion. One white man told him, if you surrender, come out with your hands up, you'll be protected. When Dr. Jackson walked out of his house with his hands up, historians say a white ruffian shot him. This great doctor would later die of unattended wounds at an internment camp. I don't use that word lightly. That's what they called it, where Tulsa was rounding up black people. The Frisell Memorial Hospital, a hospital for black people, had been burned to the ground. Walter White, an investigator for the NAACP, went undercover to investigate this massacre and many others in this country. He had a particular skill. I'm just going to tell you. It's not written in the speech. 
Walter White looked like he was a white man, but he was black. White people would talk to him. He investigated Elaine. He investigated Tulsa. This is what he wrote in 1921. Many stores, uh, stories of horror were told to me, not by colored people, but by white residents. One was that of an aged colored couple saying their evening prayers before retiring in their little home on Greenwood Avenue. A mob broke into their house, shot both of the old people in the backs of their head, pillaged their home, and then set it on fire. The mob moved methodically through Greenwood, setting fires house by house, block by block. They burned a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 re restaurants, four drugstores, eight doctor's offices, more than two dozen grocery stores, and the Black Public Library. More than a thousand homes were torched, the fires becoming so hot that nearby trees and outbuildings also burst into flames. The mob prevented city firefighters from putting out the fire. Millions of dollars of black wealth vanished that day. Some historians describe what happened in Greenwood as a massacre, a pogrom, or to use a more modern term, ethnic cleansing, according to the Tulsa Race Riot Commission. Survivors recall that white people dumped black bodies into the Arkansas River or buried them in mass graves. In the aftermath, Greenwood smelled of death. The governor of Oklahoma called in the out-of-town National Guard to, units to keep peace because the local units had joined the mob's destruction. Rather than protecting Greenwood's residents, they detained them in internment camps at the city's convention hall, baseball park, and fairgrounds. While they had been detained, mobs looted their homes, stealing furs, pianos, music players, furniture, clothing, and disposed of the victims' bodies. One survivor recounted seeing bodies thrown in trucks. They were Negroes with their legs and arms sticking out through the slats. On the very top was a little boy, just about my age, he looked like he had been scared to death. Now, it's important to note here that the oral tradition of storytelling in African cultures is as credible as a document. For years, nearly 100 years, remember, survivors told these stories about mass graves. Descendants of the massacre say that it, it is essential to listen to them. Where are they buried? Where are the mass graves that survivors remembered? Nearly 100 years of silence followed the massacre. These are the stories they didn't want you to know. Many newspaper accounts of the rampage vanished. City officials called the massacre an embarrassment, and they tried to cover it up. They didn't want the world to know that the city, which advertised itself as the oil capital of the world, had endured a massacre. The massacre was left out of textbooks, even in Oklahoma. White people, many of whom had taken photos and created postcards of themselves standing over dead bodies of black people, went silent. And despite the evidence of these photos and postcards, no white person was ever arrested for attacking black people during the Tulsa Race Massacre. Black people often spoke quietly about what happened for fear such a massacre could occur again. My own aunt told me that as a child, she overheard adults in the kitchen of my grandmother's house whispering about the riot. That's what they called it then, the riot. In 2018, the city of Tulsa opened a new search for mass graves. 
And in October 2020, the city discovered a mass grave in Oak Lawn Cemetery. Last week, the city of Tulsa began another excavation, expanding its search. On Friday, just four days ago, scientists in Tulsa working in the mass grave, Kevin was there, found 12 more coffins. Kevin Ross, who's the chair of the Mass Graves Public Oversight Committee, told me that the coffins discovered on Friday were stacked one on top of the other in possibly plain pine boxes. So I want you to know that Tulsa is but one city looking for mass graves. Historians have told me that more than 30 racist terror massacres were committed against black Americans in the last 100 years. Before we close, I just want to briefly give you an overview of other massacres, because this expands our knowledge and you'll know how much work there is out there to do. Massacres occurred in Colfax, Louisiana in 1873, Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1898, East St. Louis, Illinois, 1970, Orange County, Florida, Okoe Massacre in 1920, Rosewood, Florida in 1923, and then the Red Summer of 1919. Let me tell you a bit about the Red Summer because it's important. I argue that it set the stage for Tulsa because the patterns were the same. During that period of history known as the Red Summer, at least 97 lynchings were recorded, thousands of black people were killed. Red Summer saw massacres in at least 26 cities, including Washington, D.C., not far from here. Chicago, Omaha, Elaine, Arkansas, Charleston, South Carolina, Columbia, Tennessee, and Houston, Texas. The term Red Summer was coined by James Weldon Johnson, the great author and composer who wrote the Negro National Anthem. Red Summer describes all the blood spilled in the deadliest series of white invasions on black homes and neighborhoods since Reconstruction. For background, you should know that Red Summer coincided with the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan and the Great Migration and exodus of black people fleeing racist terror violence and brutal Jim Crow laws in the South. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't take just a few minutes to tell you about Elaine, Arkansas. Historians say it was one of the worst massacres. It may rival Tulsa, it may, may have been worse in body count than Tulsa. Historians say that perhaps as many as 800 black people were killed in and around Elaine. And what makes it different from Tulsa is Elaine was, is a rural area of cotton fields. So the mob had to march for miles to hunt black people. Then Arkansas Governor Charles Broth himself got in his car in Little Rock and drove about two hours to Lane. There are photos of him standing in front of his car with a gun. A historian told me that that governor may have been the only governor in U.S. history to hunt black people. It was said that the black people hid in swamps in and around Elaine, very much like they did in Tulsa. Some of them saw soldiers walking toward them, and they came out of their, out of their hiding place, their hands up. And witnesses said that the soldiers fired on these black Americans. There's a mound in Arkansas which survivors there believe may be a mass grave. We've got to find them. No, you've got to find them. I'll write about it. <laughs> in closing, I just want to give you a few statistics. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, more than 6,500 black people, black men, women, and children were victims of racist terror, lynchings, and massacres in this country from 1865 to about 1950. Some historians called racist terror lynchings and massacres genocide. That genocide creates what scientists have called generational trauma. Generational trauma of racist terror lynching lingers 
It's passed from generation to generation. The racist terror causes psychological wounds of survivors and witnesses and their children. I often say, you may not know why grandmama was sad, or granddaddy was sad, maybe he, she. They f saw lynching in their childhood. My grandmother was part of the great migration from Mississippi to Chicago, and I used to ask her all the time, grandmama, tell me about what it was like growing up in Mississippi. And she would say, leave that there, child. I don't want to talk about it. My mother today still won't talk about growing up in Mississippi. So that generational trauma lingers. It's up to us, it's up to you to help heal those wounds. Part of that truth is finding the mass graves and giving those buried there proper burials. Otherwise, as the elders say, the souls will continue to wander. People whose ancestors were impacted by mass massacres still call me. They call me, my phone rings all the time, I get emails. Deneen, can you come to our town and write about this? We think there's a mass grave out there. I can't do it all. I can't. Descendants tell me they searched the grounds of these massacre sites wandering. Where, oh where my, might my ancestors be? Where are they? Where are they? The pain is etched in their faces in Elaine, East St. Louis, in Tulsa, Rosewood, and indeed across the country. Please help find them, give them proper burials. The challenge to us all is to continue to pursue the truth. Ashante, Sana, thank you. Peace, namaste. I'd like to introduce J. Kevin Ross, descendant of massacre survivor, a great journalist who has worked on the story for a long time. A long time. His father is the great Don Ross, he'll tell you about that. Just an incredible, incredible person who has worked to uncover these mass graves. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yes, please give a round of applause, Mr. Neen. At first, I was going to be very, very nervous. It's the first time to speak to so many at one time. But in my real job, I'm a third grade teacher. <laughs> and those kids can be very brutal, so I'm not scared of y'all. <laughs> I seen greetings from the great state of Oklahoma. From my village called Tulsa, better known as T-Town, I'd like to also let you know that I speak on behalf of my family who represent my village of T-Town. Includes my father, State Representative Don Ross, which I will talk about more, but I also like to give acknowledgement for those members of the POC who, along with us, have been working on this venture of the mass graves and uncovering the truth. I also make special announcement, not an announcement, but a recognition to our gov mayor, our mayor, G.T. Bynum, who in a hundred years of mayors in the city of Tulsa, he is the only one that is dealing with the mass graves issue, a pain in our community for over 100 years. He has applied city funds and resources and have continued support during his time in office. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you. My father, by trade, is a journalist. 
and he wanted me to read to him my presentation. He edited. <laughs> it's too long. Get to the point and be gone. So he butchered my presentation. <laughs> so I won't be before you long. Uh, my father's works dealing with mass grades started in high school when one of the teachers had began to give a lesson about the massacre, back then known as the riot. In that, his first hearing of it, he definitely came out and said to the teacher, that is a lie, that did not happen, I never heard of that. Well, my father did not know that there was a number of teachers at the school that also were survivors. And they put him in one room and they began, began to give him a personal lesson of those ill-fated days in 1921. As he left the service and some years later after my birth, my father began to write for the Oklahoma Eagle newspaper, a black publication in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 1968, he wrote the North Tulsa History where he brought up the first accounts of the massacre. Both white and black folks did not like the fact that he brought up that issue. But he continued on. In 1971, he wrote and produced a magazine called the Oklahoma Impact Magazine. That, that magazine is located now in the home of the Smithsonian right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In there marked the, 90, the 50th anniversary of the massacre in 1971. All those pictures and those stories were located in. I'm perhaps one of few children that knew about the riot because I had the magazine. That same magazine, I would go door to door in our neighborhood. We were one of the first blacks in the neighborhood. Uh, which was basically my first taste of racism. I went to the elementary school for the first time holding my mom's hand and I walked through those big giant doors from the perspective of a child, a kindergartner. And I saw a white kid who too was holding his mother's hand and he yelled out and said, Ma, look, there go one of those chocolate kids. I said, Ma, Ma, where's that chocolate kid? I want to see him too. My mother angered. That boy's mother embarrassed. And she shrugged my hand and said, come on here. He's talking about you. And I remember as if it was yesterday. And I look at my hand. <laughs> I'm not chocolate. My first taste of racism. And that was like shortly before they burned our car while we slept in our home. Not knowing what happened outside and the neighbors tried to wake us. We all sound sleepers, even me, even today. And we awakened with our car destroyed. Our neighbors feel that we were dead. My next experience of racism. Decade later, and thanks to social media, my friend from kindergarten that we became good friends, and I asked him not too long ago, why did you call me a chocolate kid? And he stated, well, in my family, we stayed with my grandparents, and they are very racist. They're very racist. And, and my mother said, we don't have to call people by their names like that so bad, so badly like that. So if you want to talk about somebody by their skin color, let's use ice cream. They're chocolate, you're vanilla. And then you see somebody else, you go by that. So we had butterscotch <laughs> and strawberry, all the flavors. I said, okay, I like that. Okay, so we had a good time talking, and he has since passed away. My father's journey, as, as he 
continuing on as a journalist, working for the Post Tribune newspaper in Gary, Indiana. He will return home in the late 70s, just in time where the Greenwood era was beginning to rebuild. He would later on become in the legislature where he took that same lesson that he received in 1959 from his high school teachers and brought it to the legislature where he authored the bill that created the Tulsa Race Riot Commission to study the Tulsa Race Riot in 1921. And in that, where I enter, I interviewed the testimonies of those riot survivors who were five, seven, 10, 19 years of age at the time of the riot, and they told those stories. Very impactful. Then, after the testimonies were finished, I began to work with Dr. Scott Ellsworth, the author of Death in the Promised Land, and another researcher, the late Dick Warner, as we, at that time, began to do the work of looking for the dead. In 1999, when we were about to open up Oakland, we were all excited to finally get to the truth. And at the last minute, as Ms. Denine had said early on, the last minute, the city refused to open up the graves. And the commission stated, well, we will be back. When the, the uh, commission report was delivered in 2001 to Governor Frank Keating, no other effort to search for the mass graves occurred until now, over 20 years. I'm so proud to be a part of this group of people because it's gonna help me put the rest uh, something that not only that I endure as a descendant and my family members, but other people in my city who have similar feelings and looking back in time of an era that was not kind. Today, I look back on my inheritance every day. My great-grandfather was Isaac Evett. He was the owner of the Zulu Lounge. Today, a baseball park and a freeway sits upon my inheritance. Who's to say that wasn't going to be Kevin's Zulu Lounge today? Right? I continued on, even though the Mass Graves uh, investigation section of the Tulsa Race Riot Commission did not fulfill their promise, I continue to do research in finding uh, more information. A lot of this has been played over and over again. The film that you that that was been played, and I would like that to be played over and over again. And at times I will point things out to you. That is an area was uh, highly suspected of where the riot dead was buried. Every day I will go out there and take pictures of it. And this is also an area where development of a housing district was being created. And it's been said that some of those houses, those were also the home of those who were buried there in this forgotten cemetery. I was confronted by one of the owners of that, uh, of that development and they asked me, why are you here? And I'm gonna take you this journey and I'm gonna be gone. I said that my great-great-grandmother told me that her people were buried on the south side of this creek. And he told me there's no documentation that they ever said that there was ever a cemetery. Well, that part was kind of making up. This part, I wasn't. And I said, uh, I don't know about that, my grandmother said her people were buried in. He said, what were their names? And I said, Van. He said, well, back in the clearing over here in the green belt, there's a small grave, but there's no names on them. I said, great. Take me there so I can take my picture because I was working on a story. As you see, it was called South Tulsa Tales from the Crypt. He stated that 
there are no names on it, but we preserve the area. Well, I went inside there. I saw these markers, as you saw in the, in the video, rusted markers that had been there. And as I was able to locate those markers, I noticed they were all planted like corn in a row, over two dozen, forgotten, weeds grown, not cared for. And then I looked to my left, I saw that rusted marker to the left of me. I looked to the right, I saw another rusted marker. I looked below me, I'm standing on top of one. It was getting kind of creepy, but I continued to take pictures. One day on a Sunday, as I recall, I noticed that I felt a need to go back to the cemetery, take more pictures. I went back and I saw one tombstone that did have a name on it. It had the name Van on it. it scared me to death. So as I began to take my pictures, I'm getting real close up to that van marker, taking a real extreme close up. And as I bent down, I heard a, a strange noise from the, from the side of me, from the left side of me. I know I'm by myself as a Sunday, there's no workers there. As I went back to focus on that same picture, to the right of me, still not seeing anything, but I hear the noise. I began to focus on that marker once again. And I began to hear noise from all sides of me. Now, I'm not a scary person, but I ran out that woods so fast, I know I can beat Carlos in the 84 Olympics. And I'm not thinking I'm a big guy. And as I look back, and as I ran to the fence, and I look back from where I ran from, I saw a flock of red birds come out of the trees. I couldn't believe it. Normally I see one or two red birds, but I never seen I have a dozen of them all clumped together and flying out of there. Were they the ones that were making the noise? I don't know. Rod survivor, Venice Sims Dunn, she called me after my number of articles like the one skeletal remains found, uh, part of my series at that time, South Tulsa Tales from the Crypt. So I read your articles, and I need for you to go back out there because I have people buried in that same cemetery. And I told her, I don't think I'm gonna go back there. She said, why? Because something spooked me out of there, and I don't think I'll go back. And said, what did you see? I said, red birds, a bunch of, I heard some noise, I ran out, and then when I looked back, I saw all these red birds fly out the trees. So I said, oh, you saw red birds in the graveyard? I said, yeah, oh, that's nothing but an omen. <sighs> now, my first reports got me into some trouble. I got those phone calls, you know, and I'm up there looking underneath my hood See if there's a bomb underneath it. I was getting those threats. You better leave the dead alone or you'll be a part of them. Those kind of things, but I continued on. And so I said, after all these threats and all this I'm getting, now I have a omen chasing me? I said, no baby, that is a good omen. The good omen is saying what those red birds represent the souls of those who are lost and we'll bear it unceremoniously. And it's up to you to go tell somebody. I said, okay, but what if I don't? She replied, you'll be getting another visit. <laughs> the next day I call a press conference. <laughs> and as I close, I wanna say thank you for, being a, for me to be a part of this great, great, Symposium International, I found out. I'm glad I talked to some of you all last night from law enforcement and others. I'm glad I talked to some folks this morning and helped tell my story. 
And I'd like to welcome you all to be a part of my village in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I end on this as I teach my third graders this poem. And I think it best represents this fine group of people. And that is, we the willing, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have done so much for so long with so little. We are now qualified to do everything with nothing. And then exactly, I believe that you folks, knowing the difficulties of trying to bring truth to light that's been hidden. And I thank you.